So just like the magic inside us, there's a magic inside the whole world, in the oceans, in the forests, from these microbes. But if we introduce a genetically engineered microbe into the mix, we might destroy the nature of nature, damage the ecosystem, or collapse it, cause disease. Now, what's interesting about microbes is that when they travel, they also mutate. Everyone knows about mutations now. We had a lesson on that over the last three years. Most people don't realize that many microbes transfer genes to other microbes. They transfer genes to other microbes. It's called horizontal gene transfer. There's three ways that microbes do it. And if you genetically engineer a microbe, change a genetic sequence, add a trait, it travels, it mutates, and now it's like changing, you know, like exchanging baseball cards or Dungeon and Dragon cards. It's exchanging it with other microbes around the world that they in turn travel, mutate, and exchange microbes. And they in turn travel and mutate and exchange microbes. Now, that's a kind of genetic roulette, which happens to be the name of one of my movies and one of my books. And here it's very, very relevant. What could go wrong? I'm going to give you an example of what could go wrong as a worst case scenario. One of many. On our website, you can go to the and see the film. Don't let the gene out of the bottle. In the beginning, I interviewed Dr. Elaine Ingham. She had a graduate student. The graduate student wanted to get his PhD doing research on a genetically engineered microbe that would survive in the wild. So they found a group that was genetically engineering bacterium called Klebsiella planticula. Elaine tells me it's on the root structure of every single plant in the world. But this genetically engineered variety was engineered to produce alcohol out of plant cells. And it was a very well-meaning, potentially brilliant, potentially cataclysmic idea to distribute the bacteria to farmers who can then take their crop residues and instead of burn them, put them into barrels with the bacteria and then two weeks later, it would come out as alcohol to run their tractors or sell for additional money. And then there was nutrient-rich sludge at the bottom, which was going to make great fertilizer. So this group was ready to go. And they had already done all the tests required by the Environmental Protection Agency. And it was, it was stunning. It was ready to go. And it was set for a date to release to see how far it would spread. This was before Elaine Ingham had been approached by the EPA, where we know that can spread around the world. Two weeks before that date where it was going to be released, her graduate student walked into the lab on it was a Saturday morning and was mortified and called Elaine at home and was just beside himself. So many of his plants had died. He thought he screwed it up and was going to not be able to submit the research to get his PhD. So Elaine tells me, so let's, this is what I did. I just told him, let's sort through, take the ones that were, you know, they had three different groups. They had the ones that were grown in regular soil, ones that were grown in soil with the normal Klebsiella planticula, and then the third one where it was the genetically engineered Klebsiella planticula. Only that group that had been mixed with the genetically engineered bacterium died. It had turned the plants into alcohol. It was slime on the surface of the soil. I asked Elaine what might happen if the graduate student never did that study and they released the genetically engineered alcohol producing bacterium. She said, worst case scenario, and this by the way is a really bad scenario, the end of terrestrial plant life. Think about it. 
Imagine that this bacterium, that all this bacteria spreads and starts destroying plants. It may kill its parent natural version that may die in the presence of alcohol, but the genetically engineered variety doesn't. So it may displace that niche on the root structure of all the plants, and it's found everywhere. And she said, how would you stop it? You can watch the film. Don't let the gene out of the bottle. Now, this is an example of a microbe that could cause theoretically, we don't know if it would have because there's a lot of ifs, caused a cataclysm simply by doing the job it was intended to do, although doing it better and in more ecosystems than had been considered. We didn't even have to think about swapping the genes with other microbes. So now you have all these different microbes creating alcohol. We didn't think about the mutations that might result. This is just doing what it was, what it was meant to do. We also didn't think about the fact that the genetic engineering process causes massive collateral damage and ends up doing changes that are unpredicted. And we'll talk about that later. This is just assuming that the genetic engineering was, was precise, which it usually isn't, safe, which it usually isn't, that alone could have potentially ended terrestrial plant life. They're releasing genetically engineered bacterium, bacteria in, on farm fields that, that fix nitrogen. And they're saying, oh, good, we don't have to use nitrogen fertilizer. So it won't get washed into the Mississippi and brought into the Gulf and create dead zones where there, when there's an overabundance of nitrogen, then it kills off all of the life because there's a bloom and all that. But what happens if the bacteria that, that fixes nitrogen gets swept into the Mississippi and brought down? Maybe it'll transfer into algae. Maybe it'll transfer into other microbes there producing nitrogen. So you have algae that might produce its own dead zones. That's an example. I asked Kieran Krishnan, can you think of a agricultural um, biological intervention through genetic engineering that might hurt human health? Instantly, he said this, when you release something in the soil, you want it to survive. Microbes don't always survive. You need to build a survival mechanism. And it often has two components. It's antimicrobial. It kills off the competition. It's also antibiotic resistant, not killable with antibiotics. So it's like building a tank around this nitrogen fixing microbe. Forget about the nitrogen fixing. What if the tank transfers? What if we eat it because there's some soil residue on the food and we eat it? And we do bring in soil residue into our mouths all the time. And what if that tank that helps provide extra survival becomes incorporated into a pathogen, a dangerous negative microbe inside our gut? Now, a lot of microbes are there that are positive and negative, but when they're in the proper ratio, it's fine. Some of those so-called negative ones have an important job and they're used as part of this mix. But what happens if it becomes antimicrobial and starts killing off? What if it becomes antibiotic resistant so you can't treat it? So now you've ended up transferring genetic material that were genetically engineered from soil into human gut bacteria. There was a genetically engineered microbe that was created to stop a, uh, this other microbe that causes that rain and snow and sleet and, and ice and frost, Pseudomonas syringae. It's on strawberries. It's on potatoes. So at higher temperatures, frost will occur and the crops can become damaged. So they created a genetically engineered version that was impotent. And they were hoping it would replace the one that was effective so that it would prevent 
loss of crops from frost. So it turns out they put it onto one field. There was an outcry by environmentalists and they convinced a judge to, to tell them to stop and to sterilize the whole field. The excuse at that point was there are weeds that die from frost. And if you put that out there, some of those weeds will survive over the winter and you'll end up with super weeds. That's plausible. But we now know that that Pseudomonas syringae is in the atmosphere, creating rain and snow. What happened? And it gets pushed up there. I live in California now and the wind comes in and pushes against the trees and creates an upward flow and microbes go into the air. What if those microbes that were genetically engineered displaced the ones that caused rain to occur off the coast from the coast of California? It could change weather patterns here and around the world. So this is an example of the web of life in this unseen kingdoms that we are messing with. And Bear Monsanto has a, Monsanto was bought by Bear. They have a, a, a joint venture with Ginkgo Bioworks, Join Bio, it's going to create nitrogen fixing microbes and put them in the soil. And there's another one, there's Pivot Bio. They already have microbes in 4% of the U.S corn fields. So we have these big companies putting out quadrillions and quadrillions of microbes. But then you also have students using CRISPR. CRISPR is a way to create a GMO, gene editing. It's also prone to massive side effects. And it's used in all these college biology classes. But it's also used now, even in high school, it costs less than $2,000 to buy a lab. Many people are, are doing it in their basements. And the most common organism to use is microbes. Which microbes? Well, you have a choice. You can order from one online store over 10,000 microbes. For, and then where do you cut the, the microbe along the genome We're using CRISPR? We'll talk about that. You can buy 120,000 tar targets, CRISPR, you know, sequences to target and if those aren't enough you can make your own design them online type it in it'll be sent to you if the 10,000 microbes aren't enough you can go to your local stream or your soil you can pick them up off your body and genetically engineer now think about it what if every biology class in high school and every biology lab in college and all sorts of home hobbyists are now producing genetically engineered microbes that can travel, mutate, swap genes, and damage or collapse ecosystems. You know that some of those people are going to get it in their hands and they're going to put it in their mouth. What happens with the oral microbiome? It's one of the most rich and diverse microbiomes. There's microbes in there, bacteria, that produce nitric oxide. When we don't have those, and I'm told that using traditional mouthwashes can kill that, hypertension can go up by number of points. Gum disease can increase heart attack risk by 50%. The microbes in the mouth are important. And then, of course, billions get brought down from the mouth through the digestive tract. So right now, we are in a situation of potential devastation. And the Institute for Responsible Technology, which I founded 20 years ago, we're focusing on protecting the microbiome. We wanna protect, we wanna make responsible regulation on GMOs around the world, but we're starting with the microbiome because it's the most urgent. Because unless it gets turned around, we can make irreversible changes that can affect the health of all living beings and all future generations. And what changes are those? Well, governments around the world are turning a blind eye to GMOs that are created from CRISPR and other gene editing technologies, especially if there's no foreign genes put in. But that doesn't 
mean that it's not dangerous if there's no foreign genes put in. You could knock out genes, you can create changes. Much of it is unpredictable. And how much do we know about the microbiome? Well, there's about a trillion microbes. We've identified 1%, maybe. So we don't know the majority of what's going on, and yet we are allowing the biosphere to be flooded, to be flooded with microbes that can destroy or damage the microbes that we don't even understand yet.